Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to our 10th session on the tafsir of Surah Al Rum. And alhamdulillah, we've reached uh, verse number 44. But just to quickly uh, summarize uh, the discussion up until this point, so we know that this surah begins with Ghulibat Al Rum. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs the Prophet and the Muslim community that the Romans have been defeated, you know, essentially the, the people of the book. And when that took place, when the when the Romans were defeated, the Meccans took that as a bad omen that they began to taunt them that that you, you guys claim to be recipients of recipients of divine revelation. The people of the book, the Romans were defeated and you too shall uh, share the same fate. So they began to mock and taunt the, the early Muslims. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, he predicts, he promises that after this defeat, the Romans will gain victory. After this defeat, they shall be victorious. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that, and this will also, and the believers will rejoice, either because of the victory of their Christian brothers and sisters over the, uh, the mushrikeen, or because it coincides with their, their victory in the battle of Badr. In any case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the surah with a reminder of his power that ultimately everything is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hands, which is why he is the one who can predict these things, because these things happen under his control. And then the, the surah continues, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about, he speaks about the indicators of his power, of his knowledge, and his wisdom, and his existence in creation and within ourselves. And, of course, people respond to these signs differently. Some accept them, they submit to them, others reject. And, and there were about six verses that we covered so far where the ayat began with women ayati, and from among his signs. And there was a discussion about the creation of the heavens and the earth and, you know, the, the idea that there are external indicators of God's power and his glory and his omnipotence and his omnipresence. And there are also uh, the internal indicators. And there was a discussion that we had on, on fitra. In verse number 44, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Man kafara fa'alayhi kufru. وَمَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلِأَنفُسِهِمْ يَمْهَدُونَ Whosoever disbelieves, his disbelief is to his own detriment. And whosoever works righteousness, they make provisions for their souls. مَنْ كَفَرَ فَعَلَيْهِ كُفْرُ Whoever rejects the truth. Now, Kufr here in, in this context is it encompasses all of the different modes of kufr, all of the different ways that someone can uh, can manifest kufr. You know, kufr it relates to uh, rejecting the existence of God. It, it it can apply to those who reject the commandments of God. You know, so you may have someone who rejects God God's existence outright. And you may have someone who believes in God, but they reject his messages. They believe in this, in this creator, but whenever Allah sends them a prophet or a messenger, they oppose them. So this applies to them as well. And then you, you might have someone who accepts a messenger, but, has, but takes issue with some of the commandments of the Sharia. And then, then you might have someone who accepts all of the divine injunctions, but they still have a level of kufr in them. And that is, for example, kufranu ni'ma. They don't appreciate the, the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So kufr 
has many different levels. And no matter what type of kufr the human being is displaying, it's all to his own detriment. Man kafara fa'alihi kufr. Those who knowingly reject the those who reject the existence of God, they don't do they don't do any harm to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who reject his messengers and his revelation and those who turn away from his signs, they do no harm to him. You know, as as Musa alayhi salam says in, uh, in Surah Ibrahim, verse number eight, it's a very powerful message that he gives to Bani Israel. وَقَالَ Musa, And when Moses, when Musa said to his community, وَقَالَ Musa, إِن تَكْفُرُوا أَنْتُمْ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَنِيٌّ حَمِيدٌ Musa alayhi salam, he says to his community, the children of Israel, that if you and all of humanity, if you rejected God, if you rejected faith, if everyone on earth disbelieved and rebelled against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what would happen? Would, any, would, would his kingdom diminish? Would his power be decreased? Even if everyone rejected Allah, if no one worshipped him, if no one remembered him, if no one prostrated to him, know that God is self-sufficient. He doesn't need you. And he's praiseworthy. Now, من كفر فعليه كفر. When we reject God, when we commit sin, when we hurt other people, you know, sometimes when we injure people, when we, when we physically injure them or we injure them with our tongues, this, this ayah reminds us that when we, when we do evil, that the first ones that we harm is ourselves. We harm ourselves before anyone. So for example, if I insult someone, yes, I, I afflicted harm on that person, emotional harm. But the first person who was harmed in reality was my own soul. I harmed myself before them. So when we do evil, we afflict harm on ourselves before others and that harm actually endures if we don't repent and if we do good we are the the first beneficiaries of it man kafara fa'alayhi kufr you know when you do evil when you reject you, it's to your own detriment wa man amila salihan anfusin and when you do good you do it for yourself you do it for your own soul وَمَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلِأَنفُسِهِمْ يَمْهَدُونَ And whoever works righteousness, they make provisions for their souls. You know, يَمْهَدُونَ comes from the word mahd, which, which literally means to spread something out, and, you know, to make it comfortable. That when, you, when we do good in this life, brothers and sisters, we're, we are essentially making a deposit into our afterlife. You know, the, the word yamhadun comes from the word mahd. You know, mahd is a cradle. And a cradle is this comfortable resting place for a baby, for an infant. When you and I do good, what are we doing? We are investing in the hereafter and we're making the hereafter a comfortable resting place for us. You know, in the same way that a cradle is this comfortable resting place for a, an infant, Allah says, when you do good, when you do it for your souls, you are, you are creating this comfortable atmosphere for yourselves in the hereafter. And this is something that we have to take seriously, brothers and sisters. You know, we spend a lot of time investing and thinking about our, our retirement in this life that we often forget about our ultimate retirement. I mean, think about how much, and I'm not saying that no one should plan for their worldly retirement. You know, it's important to manage your money and be, and be uh, you know, fiscally responsible. 
but how and and people spend a lifetime saving and planning just so they can be comfortable for 10 15 maybe 20 years maximum look at how much energy you know they they meet with their financial advisors on a regular basis they set aside money they're willing to make sacrifices to ensure that they have a comfortable worldly retirement imagine how much effort we have to make to ensure that we have the ultimate a comfortable retirement in the hereafter you know this is why anil al mu'minin alayhi salam he used to think about this investing in our ultimate retirement when he used to go out into the open deserts and he used to admonish himself he used to say ah in ah min qillat az-zad the imam used to complain to himself that his provisions are very little if amir al-mu'minin is concerned about the provisions that are meant to sustain us in alam al-barzakh on the day of judgment and in the hereafter in what do what do you and i say it's a long journey you know brothers and sisters when we when we go on vacation you know say you want to take a one month vacation overseas how much do you pack you, you bring a lot of, you bring a lot of clothes you know you make sure that you have a full suitcase to get you through that full month you make sure you have all your medications your toiletries you might pack you know 20 30 shirts 20 30 trousers and if you and if you have a wife she's probably going to have six suitcases why because that's a long time it's a long journey amir al mu'minin you know he he expresses concern over that long journey it's a long journey brothers and sisters that death is just the first step it's it's the the gateway and then you have alam al barzakh which god only knows how long that is and then the day of judgment and the diff- the obstacles of the day of judgment it's a long journey you know we have to put enough gas in the tank you know if you know that you're going to drive you know 500 miles you can't have a you can't have a quarter tank you just can't you need to make sure that there is enough fuel to get you to your destination that you have enough provisions to allow you to safely get to your destination wa man amila salihan fali anfusihim yanhadun those who and f- those who work righteous deeds who do good deeds they are they're doing they are they're making provisions for their own souls there's a tradition from imam as-sadiq and by the way going back to the the statement of amir al-mu'minin when he says ah in ah min qillat az-zad you know how how small are the provisions that we have gathered in in this life for the hereafter and how long is the journey that awaits us in the hereafter ah in ah min qillat az-zad wa bu'd as-safar wa wahshat at-tariq it's a lonely journey You know, that's why when we put people in their graves we pray salatul wahsha for them because this is the beginning of that lonely journey the only companions that you have you know are your deeds what you did your deeds materialize they become the things that are in your company they that's your reality becomes what you did you have to confront it There's a tradition from Imam As-Sadiq where he says in al-amal as-salih la yadhhabu ila al-jannah the the good deeds that we do they go they go ahead of us they go they enter paradise fayashalu li sahib you know the good deeds that we do they they go ahead of us they precede us into that world كما يبعث الرجل غلاما فيفرش له imagine that you had a maid and you send your maid into one of your rooms to to prepare your bed so you can rest 
the, the Imam is giving an analogy here. He says that when you do good, it is like that person who sends their maid to prepare a room for them to rest. So whenever you do good, you're making a direct deposit in your akhirah. You're, you're spreading that, uh, that place. You are furnishing your akhirah for yourself. Verse number 45:: That from his bounty, he may recompense those who believe and perform righteous deeds, truly. Truly, he does not love the disbelievers. Brothers and sisters, the good that we do, in essence, in reality, it doesn't make us deserving of paradise. You know, the reward that Allah has prepared for the mu'mineen, for the believers, for the good doers, it doesn't, uh, it's not commensurate with their actions. You know, it, it's, it's, it's comparable to, you know, to someone who mows your lawn. They do something very simple. They mow your lawn and you give them $2 million as compensation. Mo, you know, cutting someone's grass does not deserve that type of compensation. You know, it's, it's not commensurate with the effort and the action. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when Allah rewards the believers, He doesn't give them what they deserve. He gives them from His bounty. And this is why, you know, the Prophet, he says that no one enters Jannah except through the rahmah of Allah, through the mercy of God. Meaning that... You, no one deserves Jannah. You know, we don't even deserve to exist, let alone be given paradise. This is all from Allah's bounty. So when the Prophet says, you know, no one enters paradise except through the, the, the mercy of God, they asked the Prophet, the companion said to the Prophet, Hatta ente ya Rasulullah, even you, even you enter purely through the mercy of God. The Prophet says, yes, even me, I cannot enter paradise unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows me mercy. Because no creature can do justice to God. No creature can thank Allah, can worship Allah as he deserves to be worshipped. Even the Prophet, even the Ahlul Bayt, they themselves admit that, Ya Allah, we cannot thank you as you deserve to be thanked. We, we just don't have the capacity to thank him. You know, this is why Imam Zain al-Abideen, and this is not an exaggeration for me to say that even the Ahlul Bayt cannot worship God as, as he deserves to be worshipped. They cannot praise him as he deserves to be praised. Even Imam, Imam Zain al-Abideen himself, he says, you know, Oh Allah, whenever I praise you, I have to praise you for praising you because you are the one who has given me the ability to express my gratitude to you. So, And again, you notice this, this Quranic theme of belief and good deeds. It's not enough to just say that I'm a good person, I have a good heart. And I believe in Allah and I love the Prophet and I love the Ahlul Bayt and I love Imam Al Hussein, but there's but you have nothing to show for. It's not enough to just have the correct belief system. And it's not enough to say that, you know what, I'm not gonna investigate whether God exists or not. You know, the most important thing is that I do good. No, it's that's not that's not sufficient. That to be a good person, you have to know. What is real? What is the truth? And you have to do good. You need the, you need both. You need faith and you need good deeds. 
إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الْكَافِرِينَ And he, meaning God, Allah, does not love the disbelievers. Now, it's very easy to look at this verse and say, what kind of, you know, Allah doesn't love non-Muslims. Allah only loves the Muslims. Now, it's important for us to understand what is the meaning of love here and what is the meaning of kafirin, that Allah does not love the disbelievers. What does that mean? Number one, we have to understand that, that divine love is something that is it's additional to his Rahmaniyyah. Because every creature, by virtue of its existence, enjoys a certain degree of divine love, of divine nourishment, of divine attention. So this is this Rahmaniyyah, that God's beneficence reaches and it encompasses everything. But to be the object of Allah's love, this is something that's special. Allah does not love that this, this, this special type of love is not given to the kafirin. And the kafirin are who? The kafirin is not just someone who is not Muslim and they've never heard about Islam. No, you know, Kufr in the Quran, in most cases, is not an epistemological issue. You know, we're not talking about people who just weren't able to arrive at the truth. But rather, it, it, in many verses, it, it's, it's really a reference to, you know, al-kufr uh, al-juhudi, meaning that it's, it's more of a, a moral issue, that these are people who are confronted with the truth. It's not they don't, they don't, you know, it's not that we're talking about people who just don't know. It's people who, because of their arrogance, they refuse to investigate. Or they know and they just ignore the truth. So when Allah says he does not love the disbelievers, it's, it's not that he's saying that he, he, doesn't, lo he doesn't love non-Muslims. In fact, that there, there are many Muslims who might fit into the category of kafirin, meaning that they exhibit certain types of kufr which is disliked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we, should, we shouldn't get caught up in you know, our conventional labels that when Allah says he does not love the kafirin, he's, he's speaking about the, the qualities that make a person a kafir. You know, the arrogance, the rebelliousness, the, the disregard for the truth, the injustice, that ensues because someone becomes self-centered and egotistical and all of these and all of the, the different characteristics that accompany uh, kuf. And, and as we said, to be deprived of God's love is a huge loss. But it's, impo it's impossible for someone, for any creature to completely be deprived of Allah's rahmah. That's impossible. But we don't want to deprive ourselves of Allah's mahabba. You know, this is something that we should yearn for. You know, we don't want Allah to just tolerate us. We don't want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to just you know, sustain us and, and give us you know, different blessings. We want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to love us. Because when, when you are loved by Allah, you've received a spiritual gift that is that cannot be compared to any materialistic blessing. إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الْكَافِرِينَ Verse number 46. And this is really one, a very beautiful ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, again, and this is the, the seventh instance in Surah al rum where the verse begins with وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ so verse number 46, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ يُرْسِلَ الرِّيَاحَ مُبَشِّرَاتٍ وَلْيُذِيقَكُمْ مِنْ رَحْمَتِهِ وَلْيَجْرِيَ الْفُلْكُ بِأَمْرِهِ وَلِتَبْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِهِ وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ Now listen to this ayah. And among his signs is that he sends the winds as bearers of glad tidings to let you taste of his mercy, that the ships may sail by his command, 
and that you may seek his bounty and that you may perhaps give thanks. So the, the blessing that Allah is reminding us of in this verse. So again, Allah is reminding us of you know, all of the, these blessings that maybe we take for granted and that are fully under his command and they are from him, that he is the source of all of these blessings. So the, the ni'mah of wind is mentioned. The blessing of wind. Now, in the Quran, wind is described as a source of divine mercy, as we see in this verse. But this wind is also described as a source of chastisement in the Quran. And if you remember, you know, this goes back to the idea that sometimes we can change a blessing into a chastisement if if we are ungrateful. And this is what we mention in Dua Kumayn when when you know when we read Allahumma ghfir li al-dhunub al-lati tughayyiru al-ni'am Oh Allah forgive me for the sins that change, that make blessings change, meaning that make blessings change into chastisement. So wind in the Quran is mentioned as a source of mercy, but it's also, it can also be a chastisement. You know, for, for instance, when we look at Surah 69, verse number six, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed an entire civilization using wind. As for Ad, the, the, the civilization of Ad, this, this ancient community, Allah destroyed them through what? Through a violent wind. It was completely obliterated. You know, even today, we see that entire cities, entire neighborhoods are decimated because of a hurricane, because of a tornado, because of a tsunami. So you see that wind can be a very destructive force. And, and at times, this wind can be a source of divine mercy. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ يُرْسِلَ الرِّيَاحَ مُبَشِّرَاتِ That among his signs is that he sends the winds. The winds. And interestingly in the Quran, the, the plural of, of wind is riyah. So you have rih, which is the singular, and you have riyah as the plural. Now, in most cases, I would have to go through the Quran, but from, from my memory, from most in most cases, when the plural is used, it's, it refers to mercy. And when the singular is used, it refers to a type of punishment. And again, Allah knows best. You know, this is just my own reflection. And this is the idea. It, this could be a reference to the fact that most of the time, wind is a mercy. And the anomaly, on rare occasions, wind becomes a destructive force. So again, you see that divine mercy always outweighs divine wrath. You know, subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, when you look at even the 99 names of Allah, the overwhelming majority of them, I would say maybe even 90% of them, refer to very beautiful things. They are very, very, very positive. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Muhi, Ar-Razzaq, you know, the sustainer, Al-Wadud. And then you have maybe 10, 15% of them that, that convey sternness, you know, Al-Muntaqim, Al-Mumit, al 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 Al-Jabbar. But the majority of, of 
divine names are are very positive. You know, they're all positive, but uh, only a few of them refer to God as being a punisher or the one who, you know, uh, the one who seeks vengeance. These are a minority of uh, of verses. You know, when you look at Jannah, paradise, for example, we have narrations that say that paradise has eight gates, while Jahannam has seven. Why is that? You know, from we understand that the the pathways that lead to Jannah are more than the the roads that lead to hell. That God's mercy always surpasses his his wrath. So, in essence, everything that Allah creates is a blessing, and, and sometimes, in many cases, we turn those blessings into sources of misery and chastisement and and destruction in our lives you know you know wealth and children these are blessings of allah but if we don't if we don't deal with them if we don't have the right attitude about these things they become they become problematic they become a source of fitna innama amwalukum wa auladukum fitna so in essence, everything is a blessing, but of, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can turn these blessings into chastisements. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, He calls the winds mubashirat, bearers of glad tidings. Now, how are how is wind a considered how are winds considered glad uh, bearers of glad tidings now obviously you know w wind has a significant impact on on life on earth and i'll you know i'll mention just some of the the more obvious uh you know benefits of wind especially you know in, in the context of wind being a glad uh, a bearer of glad tidings so obviously winds they, you know, they carry and they spread the clouds and the clouds carry rain. And rain, of course, is the source of life. You know, water is the source of life on earth. So wind actually plays a role in allowing life to flourish on earth. So the most important blessing, which is life itself, is supported by this this blessing of wind. And what does Allah say after that? If it wasn't for this wind, life would cease to exist. It's what allows life to be sustained on earth. Because it moves the, the, uh, the clouds and the clouds transport water around the earth. And I, and I can tell you that, you know, this is a, a, a very beautiful system that Allah created. You know, today I, uh, I you know, I had to fill up the, uh, this little pool for my daughter to swim in, in the backyard. And the, uh, the hose, you know, was the hose was just too slow. So I had to kind of, you know, I had to have the hose running and I had to go in and out of the house carrying buckets of water to fill up this little swimming pool for her. And it's very, it's physically strenuous to transport water that way. It's exhausting. Can you imagine that Allah didn't create this, this water cycle for us, that we didn't have clouds? How on earth would we transport, you know, millions and billions of gallons of water around the, around the earth? It would be impossible. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has created this, this, beautiful vehicle for us you know the wind and the clouds and and water is the source of life and this ni'mah allah says i send the wind as bearers of glad tidings so you can taste my mercy taste you know why does allah say so you can taste you know if if i'm cooking a meal and I, and I say to you what? Come and taste it. Now, what does that mean? 
If I tell you to come and taste it, come and just taste the food. That doesn't mean you eat the whole plate. Taste means what? You take a little, a little bite. Or if I'm making a stew, come and taste this. You take a small amount of it. And this is powerful, brothers and sisters, that the winds which, which move the clouds and the clouds which carry rain and the rain which is the source of life, all of this, all of this is merely a taste of Allah's rahmah. It's like one little drop, one little taste. Now, now usually when someone, if I say to you, you know, Brother Zain, taste this stew. I'm implying what? That you get to taste it, but there will come a time where you like, you can actually have it. Which means that the rahmah that we taste in dunya is just a taste. It implies what? That we have not even begun to experience the vastness of Allah's mercy. And this is why we have a tradition, many traditions uh, to this effect. You know, one from the Prophet where he says, in Allah Ta'ala khalaqa mi'ata rahma. That Allah has created 100 parts of His mercy. So there are 100 parts of divine mercy. Farahmatun bayna khalqi. One part of His rahma. So one part of that mercy is what Allah is the is the love and the affection that we witness between creatures. Meaning the mother that loves and shows affection to her children. And the, the mercy and the love that people share. This is only one part of that divine mercy. You know, if you think about it, where does this motherly instinct come from? Where does that love come from? This altruism, where does it come from? This compassion, this affection, this love that is seen among creatures. Even in the animal kingdom, you see that, you know, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the mothers, they look after their cubs, for example, and they're so affectionate with them. They're so loving. We see this throughout creation. That this is only one part of that, that mercy. How about the other 99 parts of divine mercy? And Allah has preserved 99 parts of that mercy for his servants. Those who are beloved to him. Those who are dear to him. So what we experience of Allah's mercy in this life is just a taste of it. Meaning the hereafter is a world that is better designed to showcase the, the vast mercy and bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, one of the, the benefits of this wind, you know, just one example the Quran mentions, and I think it's a, it's a beautiful example, and I'll mention why, is that the ships may sail by his command. Can you imagine if there was no wind, you know, how the ships would, uh, would sail? You know, how, how, much, how much fuel would have to be used? You know, a lot of, you know, the... Uh, the uh, the motion you know the the ships they they depend on uh, the wind and speaking of you know ships you know and you know you know the wind generates the waves and the and the the ships they take advantage of uh, of the waves to travel in the sea you know brothers and sisters that 90 percent of the world's trade happens is carried by sea so this ni'mah you know our ability 
you know, having ships sail in the sea and benefit from the, the energy of the wind and, uh, you know, the gusts of wind, all of this is what? You find that 90% of global trade happens through, through the sea. So if it wasn't for the wind, you know, this, we wouldn't be able to, to engage if it wasn't for this system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, that he has made traveling by sea easy for us, you can only imagine how difficult it would have been for us to, to exchange goods and raw materials with people around the world. So this wind, it's a bearer of glad. So winds are bearers of glad tidings because of, you know, the rain, because of the cloud, because the, the clouds are, are, uh, are dispersed and they're moved through the wind. And the wind also distributes and it carries pollen, which is the source of vegetation. So wind plays a role in the, distri the distribution of water through the clouds. It plays a role in, in vegetative life the distribution and the carrying of pollen. It also aids us when we travel using ships. And, and as I mentioned, 90% of world trade happens and is carried by the sea. And of course, this is the most cost-effective way to move mass goods and raw materials around the world. So going back to the verse, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ يُرْسِلَ الرِّيَاحَ مُبَشِّرَاتٍ وَلِيُذِيقَكُمْ مِنْ رَحْمَةِ وَلِتَجْرِيَ الْفُلْكُ بِأَمْرِهِ وَلِتَبْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِهِ So that you may seek his bounty. You know, this wind is the cause of a lot of great bounty. The water, the, you know, the vegetation, the commercial benefits of, of wind. And so perhaps that you may be thankful, that you may have gratitude. And this gratitude, of course, is, is not just to, just to say, to express gratitude with the tongue. It's to understand who is the source of this blessing. It's to understand how to, how to thank him, you know, having this true deep appreciation at the level of the heart, expressing that gratitude, you know, practicing that gratitude and also expressing that gratitude through, through action. Yeah. You know, because gratitude is, is practice. It's demonstrated through action. How, how are we using these divine blessings? You can't say that you're grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessing of wind if if these resources are being used in a way that that is destructive if these blessings are used to make the world more intolerable then this is not this is not how we express gratitude so gratitude is is uh, is a practice so perhaps you may be thankful and unfortunately we know you know, from the Quran, min and very few people are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I, I think we'll conclude there. We'll uh, pick up our discussion, inshallah, next week. If there are any questions or comments, uh, we can take them uh, at this time. Assalamualaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Could you please uh, go into more depth on what is meant by God's love and what it means to have it? So there is a there is a narration, and I'll actually I'll pull it up that that speaks about uh, uh, divine uh, love. One second. So if you want to just maybe go to the next question while I pull this hadith up. Um, the 
the hadith from the prophet about nobody enters paradise except through the mercy of God. Could that be interpreted to say that the rahmah that people experience while in this dunya was what led, was was what qualified them to enter paradise? Can you repeat the question? What, uh... So uh, the question is basically that could is it the it, the, oh, this is regarding the verse, the, the the hadith about nobody enters paradise except through the mercy of God. Yes. And through that rahma, and could that rahma, um, the way it was like, the way it's been described often, it talks about the rahma that we would be given in the next world that we're being entered into paradise despite not having um, done enough good deeds to deserve it. Yeah. But could it also be interpreted to say that? It was the rahma that we experienced on, in this world, which allowed us to do the deeds, which would qualify us for paradise. Okay, yeah, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think we need to to limit it. You know, of course, the opportunities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us in this life are a manifestation of, of his rahma that allowed us to, you know, you know, you know, allowing us to find guidance, you know, putting certain people in our lives exposing us to the truth in this life you know this is of course uh, a rahmah of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but uh yeah so it, it can it can encompass that uh, that shade of divine mercy but i think what 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 the prophet was alluding to is that that no one enters paradise because they deserve it meaning that the reward of paradise is so immense that it's it's not it's just simply not commensurate with the the actions that are performed. So because it is impossible for us to thank Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in a way that uh, in a way that is befitting uh, for Him, then you you we understand that paradise is purely an act of divine grace because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to judge us strictly I mean really how many of our deeds are done purely purely for the sake of Allah you know a, a lot of what we do is polluted with 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 shirk we, we don't do it sincerely and uh and you know if you look at our prayers yeah someone even if someone has never missed a prayer in their lives what's the quality of that prayer so I think what the prophet is trying to convey is that, you know, forget about our good, our sins, even our good deeds often lack uh, quality. And even someone like the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, whose, whose prayers cannot even be compared to ours, whose God consciousness is something that we can't even fathom. You know, even the prophet, he says that, you know, I, I, as a human being who is limited, cannot worship God as he deserves. It's simply impossible. And, and that's really what is meant by uh, the expression, the saying where the prophet says, no one enters paradise except for the mercy of God. Meaning God overlooks and he pardons our sins. And even, if, even when our good deeds lack sincerity, he, you know, he pardons us and he forgives us and, and he rewards us. Not because we, we are deserving, because it's in his nature to forgive and to be generous. So going, uh, going back to the first question about what it means to be, uh, to be loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is uh, a tradition, and it's, it's reported, uh, I believe, by Imam al-Baqir and, and perhaps other imams, where it says, مَا يَتَقَرَّبُ that, that basically the, the servant, the abd, does not attain nearness to God through anything that is more beloved to Allah than that which he has made incumbent. Meaning that if we want to attain nearness to Allah, it is attained through fulfilling our wajibat. You know, you cannot, you can never say that I'm going to ignore my wajibat and I have, there's a detour that I can take to Allah. There is nothing that is more beloved to Allah than fulfilling what he has, uh, that he has requested you, that what he has made obligatory. Now, after someone fulfills the wajibat, if you want to go above and beyond, you do the mustahabbat. 
you know, this is why fiqh is important. That after you fulfill what is obligatory, when you fulfill what is obligatory, what you have done is you have essentially protected yourself from harm. You know, when you do your wajibat, it doesn't mean that Allah is automatically going to be pleased with you. What it means is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have met the minimum threshold. Meaning that you have repelled punishment if you just do the bare minimum. But that's not what we want. We don't want to just do the bare minimum. We want to be ambitious in our relationship with Allah. You know, it's the same idea. You know, if, you're, if your boss tells you to, to, you know, complete a project, you know, you, you can do the bare minimum. And again, he might not fire you because technically you did the work. But if you want your boss to be happy with you, what do you need to do? You got to go that extra mile. You know, they always say you got to go the extra mile if you want to be promoted. So the narration says, وَإِنَّهُ لَيَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّافِلَ حَتَّى أُحِبُّ that, You know, it's, it's essentially a hadith Qudsi where Allah says, and then my servant seeks nearness to me through the superfluous prayers, through the recommended prayers. You start doing the nawafil. And then what happens? حَتَّى أُحِبُّ Until I love him until my abd becomes beloved to me. Up until this point, he was not beloved to Allah. You know, Allah, of course, he appreciated his deeds and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will presumably award him. But to reach a level where you are beloved to Allah, what does it mean to be beloved? فَإِذَا أَحْبَبْتُ Allah, he explains, when I love my servant, when I fall in love with my servant, I become the hearing through which he hears. And I become the sight through which he sees. And I become the hand through which he acts. Basically, Allah is saying what? I become his right hand. You know, have you ever heard of the expression, you know, usually when a king, I'll give you this analogy to make to make this hadith even more clear. If there is a powerful king, you know, let's say, for example, I'm a powerful king and I really love Brother Zayn. If I want to illustrate to everyone in my kingdom that he is very close to me and he's very dear to me, I might say something like Zayn is my right hand. What, is, what does it mean when I say Zayn is my right hand? It means he represents me. Or is, Zayn is my eyes. You know, Brother Zayn, he is, he is my watchful eye. What that means is what? That he is my representative, right? And what an honor to be a representative of a powerful king. Not me, Zayn. So here, what does Allah do? Allah doesn't say that when my servant becomes beloved to me, I become his representative. It, no, when, when the serv- when Allah is saying that when when the servant when my servant becomes beloved to me, it's not that Allah says that He represents me, but rather Allah is saying I represent Him. It's different. It's like the King saying I represent Zayn. It's one thing to say that Zayn represents the King. And this is why Allah says, I become the sight through which he sees. Meaning I take control of his life. I become the direct manager of his life. That the relationship suddenly changes where Allah says, now I am at your service. This is what happens when Allah falls in love with his abd. The relationship changes. You know, you're, you're no longer the representative of God. Allah says, now I want to represent you. And this is what the kuffar are missing when Allah says, in Allah, la yuhibbul kafir. So whenever Allah says, God does not love such and such, God does not love the oppressors, God does not love the ungrateful, this is what you are depriving yourself of. 
Because Allah's Rahmaniya is afforded to all. But Allah's love is something that is very special. Does that make sense? I hope I didn't confuse anyone with that example. Uh, that, that was really helpful. Thank you. And, and on the follow-up to the previous question about uh, entering paradise, except through Allah's mercy, I, I understand the bit that you said that you nobody deserves of paradise because paradise is such a high reward that we all get. Uh, is it your understanding that a person would be deserving of something lesser than what paradise is, or is that they would actually be deserving of hell without Allah's rahmah? You know, as I said, someone, you know, someone who does good, you know, there, I, there's a narration from the Ahlul Bayt, and just, I'll just paraphrase it, where they say that if it wasn't, even if hell and paradise did not exist, we would still obey God because everything that he legislates is for our own good. So it's, it's not that, it's not to say that, okay, you did this and, and therefore you deserve a reward. Even in this life, when we do good, we, we benefit from it. So it's not that I, I'm, I'm saying that you deserve a lesser reward. You know, again, we don't deserve anything. So if we don't deserve to exist, any type of reward is not, is not uh, you know, it, it's, it's not something that we can claim is our, is our right. Jannah is not our right. Existence itself is not our right. It's all, it's all purely divine grace. So it's not that I'm saying that we, we deserve, you know, a, a more basic level of Jannah. The word deserve and the word human being don't, should never be put side by side when we're talking about Allah. You don't deserve, we don't deserve anything. That's the reality. I mean, we have to kind of understand who we are and who Allah is. That he has, he has afforded us, he has, grant, he has bestowed upon us the gift of existence. He is trying us for a very, very short period of time. And he has given us all of the means and all of the resources to achieve salvation. And if we achieve salvation, the reward is ast it's beyond our imagination. It's literally like me telling you, Brother Zain, you want to take a two, a, a multiple choice question and you can ask a friend and I can also help you with the answer. And if you get it right, you get $10 trillion. That's the equivalent of the, of what Allah is off, what Allah has given to us. A small trial and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened up the gates of forgiveness, repentance. He has sent guidance so we have to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for even giving us this, this amazing opportunity. So anyone who fails has no one to blame but themselves. And Allah subhanahu and, and, and believe me, brothers and sisters, the majority of human beings will not dwell in hellfire for all of eternity. You know, Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam, and you know, in Dua Kumayl, what is there's only a certain group of people that are. In Jahannam eternally. You have vowed to make hell the eternal place of those who are stubborn, mu'anid. It's like someone who's in, in jail and you say to him, and, and they've committed the crime. You know, there's no not a shadow of doubt. There's video footage, there's DNA evidence. And all they have to do is admit. Just admit that what you did was sincerely admit that you made a mistake. Ask God for forgiveness. If they do, they're released. But there are some people who are so rebellious that they're stubborn. So as long as that stubbornness exists in the heart, they're in Jahannam. That's, and, and that is the, the physical manifestation of that stubbornness. But if someone repents sincerely, if that, that quality of inand is uprooted from the heart, then Allah takes them out and they enter Jannah. Because the, the spiritual contaminant, the, the spiritual disease has been treated. 
But what do you do about someone who is stubborn, who's rebellious? So Mu'anideen are the ones who are uh, uh, eternally bound in, par in Jahannam. Uh, th thank you very much. That, that was really helpful. And another question, would you agree that the purpose of gratitude to God is to enable us to be in touch with him and in the humility to hear God? Or perhaps, or is there another purpose of gratitude? Of course, gra you know, gratitude engenders love, you know, uh, for the creator. And, and of course, when, you know, when you recognize that these, these bounties, and these blessings and these favors are from him, of course, it, you know, it engenders this, this love for him and it deepens your, uh, your relationship with him. And when you become a God conscious person, you, you live a happier life. You know, I mean, that's just a fact, you know, people who are God conscious are happier people. They're more tranquil. And when you're a more tranquil person, when you're a more God conscious person, you're more humble and you're more pleasant to other people. You're more beneficial to other people. So, you know, you become a source of, of rahmah. You become a source of blessings. You become a source of goodness when, uh, when, uh, when you're a person of gratitude. And gratitude really begins with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's the source of all blessings. So it, it really permeates uh, every, every dimension of your life. So when you're, when you're grateful to God, you you're just a more you're just a happier person you're you're more grateful to to the people in your life to all of the different you know uh you know vehicles that have delivered those blessings to you when you're grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you're also grateful for your parents because through them he gave you the gift of life so you just you become a much more positive person so uh you, you know it has all of these amazing uh amazing benefits Thank you very much, Sheikh. Excellent uh, insights that you're sharing with us. And please, may Allah continue to give you long life, uh, lots of blessings, and you keep putting you in a position to continue edu educating all of us. Thank you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the rest of you. you know, because at the end of the day, we're all you know trying our best to extract and apply in our lives to make us better human beings. You know, that's that's the ultimate goal. You know, the ultimate goal is to take what we learn and and translate it into action. But uh, thank you again for all of all of your hard work, Brother Zane, all of the, the work that goes on behind the scenes to make these uh, programs uh, possible. And inshallah, I look forward to uh, to sharing some reflections with all of you uh, next week. Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and I'll see you guys uh, next Wednesday. Jazakum.